seem to know what we're doing and where we're going now, sort of. What if you could explore a world across an ocean full of culture? From here, it's all uphill. Right. Stair step for 2001. A place where the mountains are high. And I am beat. Damn it. I am happy. Woo! All the make it great epic cocktail. In spring 2009, our team of three explored 23,390 foot Harunse in Nepal. This is our story from the jungle to the heights of the Himalayas. Had one of our tent poles snap. We are still stuck here in the Good Times Clubhouse at 21,500 feet. This is the best view we've had in a while. This is Ski the Himalayas for Runse 2009. This is episode three of Ski the Himalayas for Runse 2009. We are in Shedua, Nepal. We've just come for, I guess we're there. This is now the fourth day. This is Josh oh Butson. God. Uh, washing his shirt, we've been sweating, we've been in the jungle, it's been humid, and thankfully I have John Miller here this morning to help explain that even better than I can. John, thank you. <laughs> Tell me what's going on. Well, like you said, when we'd gotten up here, we were kind of getting into the flow of things, starting to do some laundry, because it was so hot. Have we mentioned that it's been really, really hot? <laughs> and we love this place, Makalu Adventure Guest House, and with camping. Yeah, and with camping. It's amazing. <laughs> so many people spoke English, but... Um, their syntax and everything else like that wasn't well, always quite on par. Right. Well, uh, here we have, you can see there's a ladder. It looks like a, I mean, instead of having stairs, they'll have these ladders, and instead of doing individual rungs, they'll actually carve out steps in a log. But pretty interesting, you know, here we have these guys, they're out in the open air, washing, drying, and it's always kind of overcast. You can tell, you can barely see any mountains in the background, and we're sort of just stuck in this big, thick, humid environment. Noom is directly across from us there. Yeah, Noom is where we came from in episode two, and dropped down this huge valley, and then came all the way back up on this side. And I mean, I'll tell you what, what we didn't understand at the time where those chickens are just running across from the left is actually, this is pretty much the way everyone walks through the community, but it happens to just be this gigantic field. And what's so different about here from other places in Nepal was that Usually you'd stay in this guest house, <laughs> but instead here you camp out in the yard. Yep, which uh, became interesting that evening because, well, it rained. Yeah, we'll oh, get wow. into that. <laughs> so here's John under an umbrella trying to stay out of the sun. Uh, this was another one of those short days, like a three, four hour day. Pretty big elevation gain and loss. And that's Josh on the tarp there after lunch. Here's an example of that ladder right there. I mean, just taking a log and cutting steps out of it. And these kids lived in that house, you know, hanging out with the chickens and whatnot. This was the first day we had convinced them that, you know what, we don't need to eat lunch during the hike. <laughs> Let's just get to where we're going and we'll do it there. Yeah, and this is all our gear. So how do we shoot, how do we communicate with CNN as well as shoot a film while on location in Nepal with no electricity? Oh, we've got two solar panels. And this was one of the first days that had actually been clear enough, and we were there long enough that we could actually start getting things charged. Yep. Which is exciting. But yeah, the, we do a completely solar-powered operation while we're in Nepal. Some of this stuff comes from a website called humanedgetech.com. Um, some of it I've had over the years. And this is always thrilling because you're, you know, I'm, I'm a documentary filmmaker and work on a lot of different adventure travel series and... and it's like you don't have any ability to stop and charge anything if it's wet. So this is the next morning, yeah. and we've had this issue arise where we don't know exactly where our permit is, and we're trying to sort of sort out where our permit might be as we set up a uh, camp. And a little logistics between Karma and us and everybody else worked out pretty well. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, you see the trail. There's a little kind of <laughs> present. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody went to the bathroom there pretty clearly. You can see this trail coming off on the right. People always walk right through there all the time. So we're trying to call Karma and figure out where, you know, where is our permit? Because when we came into the Makalu Barun uh, National Park, we, we will have one other sort of place that has, you know, residences in it. It's another village. But that's, this is basically one of two of the last villages that you see for the next 40 days. Yeah. And we need to 
know where that permit is in case when we get to Makalu Base Camp, um, which is further up north, so that we'll know what on earth is actually going on. And if we have anyone asking us about it, uh, whether we have a permit to climb the mountain or not, we'll at least have it. And apparently it had been, uh, it's going with another group of people that are on the other side of the mountain. We had bought onto their permit and ended up leaving without a copy, which, you know, in America, it's, it's like, usually need documentation in Nepal. I think you need a sat phone and you need this guy that's on it, Gilu, who is uh, helping lead us into our destination of base camp. Yeah, and you can't, you've got to expect when doing an expedition that snags will occur. And this was kind of the first eh, big ish, but it ended up being not a problem at all. Yeah. We're hanging out in the town of Sejua. Sejua is a pretty interesting little spot. A lot going on, really. And uh, yeah, we had to move 10 sites. We actually looked upstairs to ask if we wanted to sleep inside, and it was like the, the agricultural annex of the home, the Aggie, Aggie wing. And uh, yeah, it was like rats and bugs and shit like that hanging out there. Not really, <laughs> not really what you wanted. Last night was a little tough. We had some pretty serious rain. We tend to have rain every single day at this point. And uh, a dog howled all night long. So it wasn't, uh, I think, Maybe I'm a little grumpy from not sleeping so hot last night, too. But, uh, hey, at least I got coffee. Got a good French press this year. <laughs> you got any questions back there, cameraman? Anything you need to ask? Um, yeah. Um, did you float away almost in the night? Yeah. Man, so we had this, uh, the whole little courtyard here flooded last night. So Josh and I, you know, go over our tent. We're getting ready to get in bed. And uh, in our sleeping bag, so having to sleep on top of the sleeping bag because it's so freaking humid. I mean, it's intensely humid. And so you gotta sleep on top of your sleeping bag. It's kind of sprinkling, a little rain's coming down here and there, nothing too big, and then all of a sudden, boom, just comes. Torrential downpour. And uh, suddenly the sharpers run out, or the pours run out, and they're digging trenches around a tent, and they're hauling everything all around, and the whole corner where Josh is sleeping. And he starts to boil up with water and he can push it. And it's just like a water bed on that side. And uh, we dug a trench all the way back to this middle path that runs through the field. No go. So we had to pick up the tent, move it somewhere else. We set it over in this other spot. Not so bad. But um, once the rain stopped, that's when the dog started howling. Once the dog stopped howling, that's when the rain started back. And uh, it's a vicious cycle. <laughs> Needless to say, we were fairly happy to be leaving Shadowa at that point. Yeah, it's not, uh, that, I mean, that was, that's just like a weird section. You go to Nepal, and I think a lot of people associate Nepal with the high Himalayas, but it's like, I mean, being over there as many times as I have now, I'm, I, I'm surprised at how low I've been starting lately to start these climbs, and, you know, just what sort of more remote cultures we find. This is interesting. Namaste. Namaste. Everywhere you go, people ask, give me chocolate, give me pencil, give me balloon, give mm -hmm. me pen. If you go to Nepal, bring bags of pens, chocolate, dollars, and balloons, and I think that you could probably get elected to uh, office. Absolutely. It was kind of frustrating, actually. It was, it's like, well, you don't, you don't want to encourage the little kids to beg, but it's just what they do. Yeah, and look where they live. They're growing. Yeah. I mean, you can grow rice, and you can grow some barley mm -hmm. and stuff like that, but you're... Essentially, you're growing up on a rice paddy, a terraced rice paddy, yeah. and living in rain, and they want to get educated and, and I guess, do the same thing we are, which Absolutely. is explore their own world and, and beyond. Humidity, though. It's like being in Tennessee. <laughs> These girls were cute. I was shooting, and I tried to act like I didn't see them. school right there and the kids thought we were the greatest thing since sliced bread. Yeah, totally. And I don't think they even had sliced bread. <laughs> and they can't believe it. Josh uh, is shooting this, I think, and he has the camera in his hand, but the display where you can see the video is actually facing them. So this is, you know, for the first time, some of them seeing their, themselves on video. I like that lady, she just can't believe like she's seeing herself on the camera like right now. Nice face. 
Jeez. <laughs> Technology goes a long way. Here. And of course, is Josh Butson. Extraordinaire. Ooh, we got the zoom shot. It is official. I think Nepal grows from the cutest kids in the face of the planet. <laughs> Point in <the> case. <laughs> the cool culture. I mean, really nice, nice, you know, nice people. Just good kids. This lady, she's pretty earnest. <laughs> and here we have, you know, a typical kind of, this is a way to make a living in Nepal, herds and goats. And you see these trails, and a lot of the trails have stairs, they have, you know, laid with rock, and once again, it's all done by hand. They're all, oh, and you get a bug flying around in the winds, and oh, bugs. Yeah, we, we did see a few bugs, did that. So this leads us now to the town of Tashigan, which is basically the last of towns proper as we speak of them. Uh, Tashigan is known for its bamboo, and so we saw a lot of bamboo thatch roofs like what you're seeing here, but pretty simple structure out there. I mean, that's where these guys are living. They got a tarp for a barn, you know, barley being grown, and just a cool little spot. Yep. And it's literally just perched on the side of this hillside, so it's all the town's terraced in itself. That's Josh walking past a uh, Chorton. These are little religious markings you find along the trail all the time. Getting around there, you're supposed to pass on the left side. Here we have John Miller telling us about the experience live. Yeah. <laughs> it's for, I mean, last night we had some pretty heavy rain. Today we've gotten a little rain already. And probably going to get more tonight. It'll be just. <laughs> I'm tired of being wet and humid and sweating and dripping. And it'll be nice to get up into the mountains and kind of start seeing things. Hopefully, we'll actually see the mountains at the end of tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. Have you, have seen have you the had any uh, parts of this so far that have really stood out as, as unique? I mean, other than that we've been in the jungle and it's been really hot. <laughs> I mean, you, you can't miss the culture out here. I mean, it's just per pervasive. Um, just, I mean, especially as we've gotten higher, the more Buddhist areas, I mean, the, the chortons are everywhere, the prayer flags are everywhere, the way that, I mean, everybody runs up in Namaste, and, I mean, it's just, it's amazing. We're looking around, and, I mean, it's, you know, the toil of generations, and building all of these uh, huge terraces that they do the farming on, I and mean, everything that you see has been hand-carried up here on somebody's back or on their head, or with their little tub lines across the, I mean, it's amazing. No, no. <laughs> I couldn't live like this. I'd probably go crazy. <laughs> and they just, I mean, they've got big smiles on their face. They're excited to see you. And I'm genuinely pleasant to be around and genuinely excited. Just nice people. I mean, you just can't get a, it's amazing. Um, so what do you think we have in store for us? You know, still, I mean, none of the hiking has been terribly difficult for the group of us so far. Tomorrow might actually push us a little bit, which will be exciting, but I mean, it's going to be a long hike. It's going to be, I and mean, we still have, I don't know, four or five days of hiking to get to base camp. We don't know. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll know when we get to base camp. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of up. We've got uh, the Shipton Loft Pass to go over in two days. Um, I'm mean, mostly, it'll be interesting to see how these porters react to that because I, most of these guys are from, you know, 1,500 feet down in Tumantar. So they've never been to this altitude. Never mind how we're going to act this altitude. We've got no acclimatization left. This is true, and we're headed to 22,390 feet on Barunse, so we're just psyched to see some mountains. But I, we do have plane tickets. <laughs> we do need to go home at some point. So, yeah, it's going to be a grind and kind of see what the weather hands us and who else is up there and, you know, see what happens. Cool. Anything... Uh if someone had never seen something like this, like being in Nepal and just having no real idea, like this being your first time, what really hit you so far? I mean, from airport to now. Um, so many th different things. I mean, it's it's. And what surprised me is how familiar familiar it all felt, even though I've never been here and I've never been to any developing nations or anything else like that. But just the just something about it felt very familiar. Um, but the smell, I mean, the smells are very different. Lots of wood smoke, um, lots of sweat. Um, 
lots of dung, <laughs> uh, especially in, depending on the town. I think mm -hmm. that's what they're burning for fuel. It's with you know, all sorts of different things. I think that's pr so. That's probably the the first thing that really hits you. The sights, okay. The sights, the sights. It's it's different, but it's mountains. You know, nothing really there. But the smells are unlike anything you're going to get in the U.S. Sure. Yeah. At all. And I think the biggest thing I learned is just you have to have an open mind. I mean, if you don't, you're going to freak out. <laughs> but if you have an open mind about all of it, it's just the experience of a lifetime. Totally, well, folks. That's episode three. Uh, coming up next week, continue to follow us as we enjoy ourselves and start to finally get to altitude, see some snow, and eventually we'll make our way off to Barunse to do our new route, and you'll just have to see what happens. John, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Ben. All right, see you guys next week with episode four. Dun, dun.